my goodness, they were overflowing in the foyer as well. And so God has truly, truly blessed us. Sixteen people gave their heart in the adult sanctuary on Friday night. Probably more than that in the first service this morning. And no telling what God will do in this one and then the 12 o'clock service. But both of these have been, uh, there was nearly 500 people in the first service this morning. So give the Lord praise for that. So if you don't know me, I'm Mike Sainz. I'm the lead pastor here at the Harbor, and we are delighted to see you. We, no matter how you got here, whether you saw our mailer that went out, um, or whether a friend invited you or whatever, we're glad you came. And we hope that when you leave, we've treated you so many ways, you're bound to like one of them. Amen? And so uh, it is our thrill and delight to have you. Uh, also, we are today going to conclude the... Uh, Love is a Verb series. We've had a wonderful time with it. We started out about a month ago with a message entitled Love Serves. And then we took an entire week and we served throughout the community. And I, I wish I had time to tell you about it, but I don't. And then we talked about Love Gives and we gave into our community. I don't know if you know it, but we adopted a church. We paid for all of the Easter paraphernalia, gave them a love offering as well. Went and done work on the church and just embraced them. And we're believing that God's helping them to double today as well. Amen? Amen. So we have done a tremendous amount. And then not only did love serve, love um, gives, we talked last week about love invites. And I'm telling you, there's some loving people because there's a lot of folks here. Love invites. And so uh, Friday night, we talked about when love died. I know that was a different message. And you might not have expected that to go down that way, but powerful message. If you need to go check that out on YouTube, that would be great. But then today, I want to talk with you about love on display. I'll talk with you about a father's love. And uh, let me take you back, way back, to I was 12 years old. And uh, my pastor's son, my dad was on the staff of the church, my pastor's son, Uh, come to spend the night with me. Some of you know that um, uh, pastor sons can get into some mischief. So he come over, and we were going to spend the night, and so somewhere around 8 o'clock that night, we decided to get on my bicycle. We only had one bicycle, but to get on it, and that we would ride about a mile to what we call the Magic Mark, and that was the Magic Market. That was the kind of like a 7-Eleven or Aiden's Minute Market or something like that. And we were going to buy us some cigarettes. Hello? Now, my dad was against smoking, and the church was against smoking, and and we didn't believe in it, and they still don't. And and, and I'm not saying it'll carry you to hell, but it'll make you smell like you've been. (laughs) And, uh, but anyway, uh, we decided to go get us a pack of Marlboro, and we got them, and we smoked all the way home. I don't know how we drove the bicycle and smoked, but we did, and we liked to choke, you know, when we inhaled them and all of this, but we was cool, man. And I won't never forget by the time we got back home, because we took our time, because we had to stop along the way and smoke. Y'all with me? And uh, our, both of our dad's pastors, his dad was senior pastor, my dad was outreach pastor, and so, so we get back home, and lo and behold, the door is shut. The door is shut, and, and in those days, man, that's just how it was, the door was shut. And I was kind of scared to knock, because I had all the smoke on my breath. I didn't want to knock, and then daddy come open the door, and it'd be all right if my sister did, but... She's done going to bed, and so I'm thinking, what are we going to do? So me and Paul slipped around to the back of the house on 29th Street there in Columbus, Georgia, and, and I rapped on my sister's door. She's a year older than me, Pam was, and I was like, Pam, Pam. And then I heard a little bit of movement, and I thought, man, there's hope because she ain't going to sleep. She's getting up. She's fixing to come open the door or open the window, and then I'll tell her to go open the door, et cetera, et cetera. Well, about that time, I saw the curtain fly open. The curtain flew open, and a gun filled the window. I'm talking about a 22 blank pistol, a revolver. I mean, it looked like a bazooka. And I saw the fire as it left the barrel twice. Bah! Bah! And I hit the ground. Me and Paul both thought we was dead. I mean, I'm thinking, I said, he shot us. And we thought we was bleeding out, only to find out that it wasn't even real. It was just a blank pistol. It wouldn't shoot real bullets. But, uh... So we eased on around to the front door. By now, he's already opened the door, and he's called my name, Michael. And so I'm walking around there, and I'm kind of scared. And once I got in the house, within about five minutes, I kind of thought, 
I wish the gun had been real. <laughs> because when he smelt them cigarettes, now I don't know if he smelt it or because he told me the Lord showed him. Now I don't know if the Lord showed him or if he smelt it or if God just used his nose to figure it out. Whatever, the Lord got the credit for it. And he said, you wait right here. So I'm in the living room there, and he went to get the big leather belt. And when he come in there, man, I, I could hear the buckle jingling, and I knew it was on. Man, and I got across that table there, and he beat the backside of me off. Are y'all with me? And then, in those days, he said, Paul, come here. And he tore Paul up, and then he got on the phone and called the pastor and said, John, I just whipped your son and mine because they slipped off and bought cigarettes, and they both smell like a smokestack. In that day, they didn't care, man. They'd get together and whip you. <laughs> Are y'all with me? I, I'm not advocating. I'm just saying that's how it was. But nonetheless, and now here's the thing. That night, I'll never forget, we had a, what they called a hideaway bed. That's when your couch turned into a bed. Y'all with me? So we had pulled that hideaway bed out, and me and Paul was going to sleep in the living room. My sister was over here, and my mom and dad back there in the master bedroom. And so here I am, and I'm laying there rubbing my legs, man, because they're all wept up. And my backside's wept. I mean, I deserved the whip, and I had done wrong, and I know that. But I, I was laying there hurting, and I can remember thinking, man, you know, it's not really the pain in my legs. It's not the whelps on my backside. The pain was coming from my heart. Because I listened to my dad as he talked about me smoking and being disappointed in me. And uh, I heard the, the disappointment in his voice. And when he walked away... I remember laying on that bed with the lights out, looking up into the darkness, thinking, is he ever going to forgive me? Is he ever going to love me? Are you with me? Now, here's the truth. The truth is he loved me more than words could say, or he wouldn't have spanked me like he did. You know that is biblical. The Lord, did you know he spanks or chastens those whom he loves? And what father does not discipline those children that he loves? If he'd let me just be buck wild, I'd be in prison now. True. Amen. But he loves me, but the devil has got me thinking he must hate me. There ain't no way in the world that he loves me. So I, I said that to say this. I will never forget those thoughts, but Satan will use that to upset you and say that he is so disappointed. Your heavenly father is so ashamed of you, and he'll break out every adjective to describe the anger and angst of God against you. But here's what you need to know today. God loves you even when you do stupid things. Brother Sean, you said you do them every day. God loves you when you do dumb things. God loves you in spite of the fact that you did it even though you knew better. Now, I'm not saying he's just going to wink at it and say, come on to heaven. There will be ultimate punishment for sin that is unrepented of. So I'm not saying that he's just going to rubber stamp our activity and all that we do by no means. But I am saying this, there is nothing that you have done or that you can do to make God love you any less he lo or any more. He loves you perfectly right now. Amen. You see, uh, I thought I had let him down, and I had. I, I, I thought he was frustrated, and he was. But the lie was that he wasn't never going to love me, that he wasn't never going to accept me as his son anymore. And so what has happened, the devil has told many of us, that we've gone a bridge too far. We have done one thing too many, that God cannot love us anymore. He cannot forgive us anymore, and it's simply wrong. So he loves you despite your bad decision. He loves you despite the, the times you went ahead and done things, even though you sought out counseling and they said, no, don't do that. You prayed and you felt like and you knew in your heart you wasn't supposed to do it, but you did it anyway because you wanted to. And God still loves you despite that fact. He may be frustrated, but he still loves you. So why is that important, Pastor? Why do you keep driving that? It's important because there are those here who feel like you've done things so bad and you've gone so far that God could never love you again, that he would never accept you again. And the truth is this, he never stopped loving you. Even, can I give you an example? You remember King David? King David, a man after God's own heart who committed adultery 
with Bathsheba. It was horrible. Then he tried to lie and cover it up. And, and then he had her husband killed. And he'd done some dreadful things and some terrible things. But he repented of that. And God forgave him. And he's still a man after God's own heart. Wow. I'm not saying that God condoned it. I'm simply saying there is, you see, because Jesus died on that Friday some 2,000 plus years ago to make atonement for sin. He gave his life so that you and I could have ours so we could live. So in Luke chapter 15, Jesus told a trilogy about lost things. Three things he said. He said there was a lost sheep, then there was a lost coin, and then there was a lost son. I want to key into the latter, if I may. In fact, he told the story in Luke chapter 15 that goes like this. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, give me my share of the estate. Now, I didn't I know that, but, but they could actually demand the share of their estate while the dad still lived. It seemed a bit morbid to me. And that you would tell your dad to give you what's coming to you, even though he still lives. You know, it's kind of like the family getting it together, who, you know, to find out who's going to get the Cadillac and the ranch and the house and daddy's tools and all that while he's still at the table. I mean, that, it doesn't really make sense, but they could do it. And the younger one said to his father, give me the share of my estate. So he divided his property between them, and not long after that, the younger son got all together that he had, and he set off in a distant country. And there, watch this, he squandered his wealth in wild living. Now, I'm going to let you define wild. He squandered his wealth in wild living, and after, notice this, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country. Now, let me just stop for station identification. I want you to know when you leave the father's house, you will never get where he can't be. You'll never get him out of your mind completely. And so here's this son in a long, long way from home. And the Bible said a severe famine come to the whole country and he began to be in need. Now it's when you run out of money and when you get in need, you will start remembering how good you used to have it. You remember when you was growing up, you couldn't wait to leave your daddy's house. I remember saying, I can't wait till I get a job and make my own money. What a fool was I. Huh? I can't wait till I can do this. I can pay my own bills. I can't wait. You know, I can be my own boss and all that. And, and those of you who have lived more than about 30 years now, you understand how stupid you were for the most part. Right? Come on. I mean, all of my kids were going to leave Camden too. And they live within five miles of me, all of them. Huh? And they come over and they bring all the eight grandchildren. We have a wonderful time. Are y'all with me? But so he goes off and he began to be in need. And he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him out in the field to feed pigs. Now I want you to understand something. For a Jew that wouldn't even eat pork, it was wrong for them. They were not to even be around them. They couldn't tend them. And now he has gone in this foreign country and he's in need. And when you get in need, you'll do things that you ordinarily wouldn't do. Some of you have, you know, you said, I ain't going to do that job. It's above me or it's beneath me until you get hungry. And then you decide, well, maybe I can slop the pigs. Maybe I can sleep out here. Maybe I can do this. And the Bible said that this guy, he got in a bad situation and he didn't have no friends. I want you to understand when he left his daddy's house, he had plenty of money. He was full of money and full of himself. He was full of friends. And then when things went bad, he wasn't no longer full of himself. He wasn't full of money and he didn't have no friends. Amen. They have a way of getting away when things go south. But I want you to understand something. I want you to know that the father, while he's at home, he still loved that boy even while he was gone. Do you know what Romans 5 and 8 says? Romans 5 and 8 says that God commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. And so then Isaiah said in chapter 53 and verse 6, he said, all of us, all of we like sheep have gone astray and God laid upon him, that is upon the Lord, they laid upon Jesus the iniquities of us all. He didn't do nothing wrong, but he took it for you and I. So uh, let me go a little further in the story. This guy, he's in trouble now. He's a long way from home. He's in a pig pen. 
He don't have nothing. And the Bible says he would fain have filled his belly with the pods that he was feeding the pigs. But even the owner required him to pay for that slop if he ate that or those pods. And I mean for a Jew to get to the point where not only would he tend the pigs, but he'd eat with them and sleep with them. Here's what I want you to know, man. When you think it's so bad in your father's house and you get out and then you find out you know, your friends left you when things got bad, they will. When the hard times are real hard, and look around and see who's with you then. That's the true ones. So he come to him, he come to his senses. I mean, something happened to him. And, um, you know, he, the Bible said it like this. He said, he came to, him, to his senses and he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and I'm starving to death? I know what I'm going to do. I'll set out and go back to my father, and I'll say I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but just make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and put his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, he paid no regard to what his son was saying. His son was trying to apologize and say, Daddy, I've wasted what you worked a third of your life for. The oldest boy got a double portion. He got the third. That's the way it was. That's the oldest always got a double portion. And uh, he said, but daddy, I, I've done this. I've wasted this. And his dad is saying, shh, 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 I don't want to hear it. And he tells his servants, he says, go back home and, and get what I've prepared. Now, I want you to understand something. He had squandered everything he had. He found himself a long way from home with no friends in a severe famine. And he thought, perhaps this ain't never going to happen to me because I got plenty of money. Well, that's the way you think when you've got it all good and you're on top. But when things go south, all of a sudden you have that aha moment. So he, he farms himself out to a pig farmer. He, he hires himself out. He's doing something that is disgraceful and detestable for a Jew. But as you know, sin will take you places that you did not want to go, and then you will do things when you get there that you would have never saw yourself doing before. Do you think the prostitute on the street set out to sell her body for another fix? Nope. Do you think the wino that's out there that, that he, just to get another drink, just to get another fix, another shot, another line, another peel, another rock, do you think that they intended to do some of the things they're doing? Do you think they intended to steal from their mom and dad and their grandparents? Do you think they intended to do all that? No, they did not set out to do it, but that just came with the territory. But one night while he's in a pig pen, and sometimes you've got to get to that low estate. Sometimes you've got to get to that nasty place, that despised place, that detestable place. When all your friends have walked out, and daddy and mama's a long way from home, and anybody that cared seems to be so distant, and you've got to be in that place. And in that place that night, in that hog pen, he had that aha moment when he came to himself. Teachers know that as when the light bulb comes on and they got it. They understand uh, uh, about algebra now or subject verb agreement and all of this stuff. And they, the light bulb has come on. He said, oh, oh, oh. You know, his stomach is growling. He's in pain of hunger. And he says, oh, my goodness. What a fool I've been. How many servants does my dad have? How many are back home? And even the hired hands on the farm, they eat good and they got a place to stay. And, and daddy looks after them and maybe they even get a bonus. I don't know, but they're out there. And man, here I am among pigs and I'm eating pig slop. I know what I'm going to do. In the morning, I'm going to get up. I'm going to go up to the big house. I'm going to quit my job. And I'm going to tell the owner of this pig farm that I'm going back home. I'm going to go home and tell my daddy that I was wrong. I'm going to go back and I'm going to make amends. And so he got up the next morning. I don't know how it went, but he come back home and he headed home. And here's what I want you to understand. And the devil don't want you to know this, but this is the truth. The devil don't want you to understand it. He wants you to think that your father is pining away. He's sharpening his, uh, you know, uh, his whip up. And he's, he's got his razor strap out there and getting ready for you and all of that. But that's the furthest thing from the truth. Here's what the daddy was doing at home. The daddy was believing that one day 
my boy's going to come home. The daddy was at home, and you know what he had done? He had gone down to the market, and he had bought him some, some, some calves. And he told his servants, he said, I want you to start fattening these guys up. And he not only went there, but he went to the linen, and he bought, he bought a nice robe. And he come back home, and I don't know if he told his wife or what, but he said, I want y'all to put that robe in his room. And then he bought some shoes one day, or maybe a cobbler made them. I don't know if he bought some shoes. And he took that ring that his son left, you know, the family ring. The boy didn't need that. He didn't need the identity of the father no more. But daddy didn't throw it away. He put it aside. And what that daddy was doing was praying and believing that one day, someday, my boy's going to come to himself. I don't know where he's at. I ain't heard from him. He's been gone a long time. But I'm believing. And that old man, I think, walked down that grass driveway or dirt or whatever and looked down the road, hoping that one day, and you know, I imagine he saw people walking by. You know, and perhaps he got his hopes up, only to find as he got closer that wasn't him. But on this day, something was different. This guy kind of walked like him. His eyes are dim because he's old now, and perhaps he's got a cane, but I believe that guy kind of walks like I walk. And as he walked around the little bend a little bit more, he got a little closer. He sure does walk a lot like me. And he squints his eyes and finally he realizes, you know, I believe that's him. And he takes another step or two and another step and next thing you know, he lets go of that cane. Hello. And he begins to, you know, walk briskly. And then it's a jog. And then it's all this old man can muster because he recognizes that's his son. He runs to him. It's totally different than the boy thought. The boy thought his daddy was there to beat him. He was there to curse him. He was there to malign him. But dad reached his arms around him and said, My son that was dead is alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. He started his rehearsed speech. He said, Father, I've sinned against you in heaven. I'm not even worthy to be called your son. Meanwhile, daddy ain't even paying no attention to it. He tells the guy that was chasing him, the servant, he said, go back to the stall and get that fatted calf. We've been fattening up for this. Go in there and get that robe that I bought. Get them shoes that I bought. Get that ring that I bought because my son has come home. I've got him a robe and a ring and some shoes and we're going to throw a party tonight. God is waiting to throw a party for you coming back home. Totally unlike the devil said. Hey, I want you to understand. So the deal is this. Some people think they've gone too far, but you haven't. So what I'm compelling you to do today, if you're lost, in just a moment to raise your hand and say, Pastor, I'm coming home. I'm coming home. Listen to me. Travel the world over. Go where you want to go. Stay in the high rises of New York and uh, Los Angeles or wherever. Stay in the rainforest or the jungles of Africa, but there's no place like home. Home is where you belong. Home is where God wants you to be. And I want to tell you some striking similarities of our Heavenly Father and this prodigal's father. Both of them had children that went away. Both of them had people that, children, that decided to do their own thing. Both of them had children that found themselves without of, out of friends and out of resources. And both of them was making provisions for the day when you would come to yourself in a hog pen. Here's the way I want to close it. I want you to stand with me if you will. Some of you know Dr. Billy Graham. He passed away last month. One of the greatest evangelists to ever, to ever speak. He has two sons and three daughters. His daughter Ruth was the one that was a little bit wayward. She was the one that was a little bit rocky. And she spoke at his funeral, and the Lord spoke to me and said, Say this on Easter. And I wrote it down, and then I lost it, and I didn't find it until yesterday evening. 
But she said at his funeral, some of you saw it. If you didn't, you can go back and watch it. She said, after 21 years, my marriage ended in divorce. I was devastated. I floundered. I did a lot wrong. The rug was pulled out from under me. My fam family thought it would be a good idea for me to move away and start fresh somewhere else. So I decided to live, move and live near my older sister, near a good church and around family. The pastor of that church introduced me to a handsome widower. We began to date fast and furiously. My children didn't like him, but they were almost grown, and what could they tell me anyway? I knew what was best for my life. My mother called me from Seattle. My father called me from Tokyo. They said, honey, why don't you slow down and wait on us? Uh, <clears throat> let us get to know this man. They had never been a single parent. They had never been divorced. What did they know? So being stubborn, willful, and sinful, I married this man on New Year's Eve, and within 24 hours, I knew I'd made a terrible mistake. After five weeks, I fled. I was afraid of him. I wanted to talk to my mother and my father, but it was a two-day drive, and questions whirled in my mind as what they were going to say. What would my children say? I'd been such a failure. What was Daddy going to say to me? What would Mother say? Would they say, we're tired of fooling with you? We told you not to do it. You've embarrassed us. And women, she said, you understand you don't want to embarrass your father, and you really don't want to embarrass Billy Graham. And many of you know that, she said, we live on the side of a mountain. As I wound myself up that mountain, I rounded the last bend in my father's driveway, and there he stood, waiting for me. And when I got there, he wrapped his arms around me. And he did not say condemning words. He didn't say anything about shame. He didn't say anything about blame, but he opened his arms and put his arms around his daughter and said, welcome home. He said, you know, my dad was not God, but he showed me God that day. And God is waiting with open arms right now for everybody that's been wayward, for everybody that's spent your, your, your inheritance, for everybody that's done wrong and you found yourself in a pig pen in a long way and no friends. And you made your mind up, I'm going to come back, I'm going to tell Daddy, I'm going to tell Jesus, that, you know, all these, you know, I was this and I was that. And he's just simply saying, here I am, just, just come home. In 1 John, the writer said, see what great love the Father lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask you today. I don't have time to, to play games. I want to ask you today, if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I, like Ruth Graham, like the prodigal son, I today want to come home. Listen, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm just going to ask you, would you simply, right now, would you raise your hand and just hold it high with me? Pastor, I want to come home. Thank you for your courage. Thank you. All over the place. How, where are you at? How about you, ma'am, sir, teenager? Just hold them high. We got people that's counting salvations right now. Just hold them high. Hold them high. Listen, I'm going to pray a prayer with you in just a moment, and then our executive pastor is going to close this out. He's going to give you an opportunity to get with an altar worker. And there's going to be a card there, and he's going to explain that. But it simply says on the front of that yellow card, I have decided to follow Jesus. That means that you decided in that hog pen place that you are, this is the end of it. I'm doing differently today. Pray this prayer with me, Father. By the grace of your son, Jesus, I come home today. I've sinned, I've run, I've done all kind of things, but today I'm coming home. I ask you into my heart and into my life, please forgive me of my sins and wash me clean. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Can the church rejoice right now with these?
Listen, I want you to do something quickly with me. If you're on the ends, uh, on this inside, there's a bucket underneath your seat that has the communion elements, the sacraments there. Could you take just a moment and pass those across your aisle? Just take one and pass it. I want to have communion with you. The staff said there's just going to be too many people. There won't be enough time. And I said, you know what? We can make time somehow. Somehow we can do it. So I want us to do that right now. I know that we're pressed, but I know that God would have us to do it. On that night when Jesus was betrayed, it was a Friday night more than 2,000 years ago. He sat down for the Last Supper and he told his disciples, I've long with great desire to eat this Passover with you, for I will not eat any more or drink any more until it's all fulfilled in the kingdom of God, until it's all done. And he took that bread and he said, I want you to take this and I want you to eat it because it's my body that is broken for you. You may take the bread. The Bible said after he had supped, he took the wine and he held it up before him and said, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. And as often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. And when you take of this bread and this cup, do it in remembrance. In other words, we remember Calvary. We look back. And he says, Then you do show the Lord's death. Watch this. Until he comes. So we're looking back at Calvary and we're looking forward to the rapture. Jesus said this, I'm going away and I'm going to prepare a place, but I am going to come again. One of the last things he said is, I will be back. Let me say this, if you accepted Jesus Christ today, it's the greatest decision you ever made in your life. But it's not a one-time parade, it's a pilgrimage from now on. You may take the cup. Let us pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray for every one of these men and women today that took of the Lord's Supper. Those who lifted their hands and accepted you as Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that they would identify with you. Like Simon Peter when he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I pray, Lord, right now for them that they would be established in the faith. It would not be just a, a monument, but it would be a but it would be an occasion that would be not just a display today, but the rest of their life. And when life is over, they will find themselves in that place called heaven. No place like home. That place where Jesus went to prepare for us. In Jesus' name.